In this episode, you'll be learning an incredibly easy method for finding your purpose in God. And this episode is very special because you'll be listening to an audiobook recording from Planting Your Purpose. And if you'd like to learn more information about this book, then you can head to plantingyourpurpose.com. You've got a dream to glorify God and make your mark on the world. Maybe you want to grow a business, start a ministry, or become a better servant leader. Whichever level in life you want to hit, I believe that God's calling all of us towards something greater than where we are now. So join me as I document my journey to learn how to grow an online ministry in ways that are effective, biblical, and aren't stuffed with complicated religious or business mumbo jumbo. My name is Alec Hassan, and welcome to the Digital Ministry Mastermind Podcast. Introduction. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, 18. It doesn't matter how fast you can go, it doesn't matter how much passion you have, and it doesn't matter how much energy you put into something. If you don't have a vision and clarity on the destination you want to reach, you'll simply never get there. Dean Graziosi. I want to thank you for taking the initiative that not many people make. When it comes to finding purpose and fulfillment, a lot of people settle for less or avoid their calling in life. And when it comes to finding one's calling or pursuing more fulfillment, we are often met with the popular suggestions to just do what you're good at or do what you're passionate about. Although this advice may sound good, there's not much substance in terms of how to act on it. Plus, we've all had jobs or pursued projects in the past where we did the things we love but still found ourselves unfulfilled or feeling as though God was calling us towards something greater. Can you recall what your first job was? For some of you, getting that first job was probably an exciting time because you saw the work as a stepping stone toward greater opportunities. For others, you may have taken the job simply out of necessity. Either way, I'm sure you took that job based on what the job could provide for you, and I'm also sure you aren't still working there. Maybe you left because there was a better gig. Maybe you stopped working there because it wasn't paying enough. Or maybe you quit because it was a toxic work environment. But imagine if you still worked at that first job. Imagine the unfulfillment and passionless life you would have been living if you still worked there. Now imagine if you went the rest of your life still working at that same job. Doesn't sound very pleasant or fulfilling, does it? In fact, I'm sure you feel like you'd be wasting your life if you did that. The first job I ever worked wasn't anywhere close to feeling fulfilling. During my sophomore year in high school, I applied to work in one of those stereotypical busboy jobs at a local Italian restaurant. Growing up in church, I learned to find satisfaction in serving others. So being able to serve and get paid for it was truly amazing at the time. My friend Evan, who was also a sophomore, had reassured me that being a busboy with him would be good. Evan was confident that us working together would just be constant fun. He told me about all the money he was making, saying how the extra cash gave him so much freedom. He could buy his own video games and order his own food, all without needing to ask or beg for his parents' permission. But the thing that convinced me to take the job was the amazing leftover food. After the restaurant closed, we got to take home all the prepared food that wasn't served. The typical work schedule entailed leaving school at 2.30 p.m. sharp, getting to the neighboring town's upscale Italian restaurant at 3 p.m., and working till about 2 a.m. The pay was okay, but the tips were fantastic, and the free food was delicious. However, the long hours and late nights soon got to me. The work was constant, my back was aching, and the pay started to not seem worth the time and energy. I barely saw my friend Evan since we were constantly running around the restaurant, and my motivation to stay faded quickly. When I made up my mind to quit, I walked into the kitchen, went to the manager, and put in my two weeks notice. His response was rather shocking. In his thick Italian accent, he emphatically exclaimed, What is this two week notice? You work, you stay, you quit, you leave. The kitchen went silent. I was at a loss of words. All the staff froze and stared at the manager and me. I tried explaining that I would be willing to work until I could be replaced, but it was quickly met again with the sharp reply, no, 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 you work, you stay, you quit, you leave. So I left. I lasted three months at that job. How is it that we can start something feeling very zealous, but end up falling out of love with what we are doing? Maybe you've struggled with a sense of purpose or fulfillment too. When there are many possibilities ahead of you, Sometimes it's hard to know the best way to go. It seems that any option is a good option, but deep down, we all want to know which option is best. When I quit working as a busboy, I felt a strange shift in my spirit, as though my character was being challenged or my identity was being tested. At that point in my high school career, I had grown to see myself as the type of person who doesn't quit when times get tough. 
During the summer prior to taking the busboy job or even starting high school, I was mistakenly signed up to join the high school football team. My friend Tarek had confused me for one of our other friends, Tom, who had expressed interest in playing. Since Tom and I were both overweight, out of shape, and had the same chubby faces, it made sense why my friend Tarek would have confused us. Instead of ignoring my friend's plea to join the football team, I reluctantly found myself walking on the field for the first day of practice. Within the first few minutes, Coach Satchel shared some wisdom with us that clearly communicated how serious he was about this sport and our involvement in it. He said, from this point moving forward, I want you all to know, if you show up to practice on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. And if you're late, don't even bother showing up. This stern and authoritative presence of Coach Satchel had alienated many of the other kids, but I found his personality and booming presence to be inspiring. After the first day of practice, I approached him to let him know I didn't think I belonged and couldn't do well on the team. I had no experience in playing football and wasn't any good at the sport. In fact, far from it. Many of the kids were better than me and enjoyed the sport way more than I did, which is probably why they signed up in the first place. In contrast, I had accidentally been signed up and it wasn't even me who did it. Satchel pointed out that even though the other kids might enjoy football, many of them will quit. For them, joining the team might have started with a passion for the sport or a joy in watching it. However, staying on the team and doing well would require more than simply liking the sport. Satchel began to explain, the older boys on this team that do well are the ones who see this sport as something beyond just themselves. They aren't here to simply rack up points on a scoreboard or have a good time. They are here because their identity is in how they perform. These boys are trying to become better athletes, which means they are working to grow physically and mentally in order to step into that role. They are here because the way they act and overcome challenges on the field is how they will learn how to act and overcome challenges in the real world. If you don't want to be a better football player, then fine. However, that doesn't mean you can't find a greater purpose for being here. This short talk had me reconsider my decision to leave the team. I thought that by not being super passionate about this sport, I wouldn't benefit from playing it, and the team wouldn't benefit from me even being there. Yet from Satchel's experience, he explained that the students who had a higher purpose for playing were the ones that could endure the hardest challenges, have the greatest growth, and bring the most value to the team. After our talk, I could see that Coach Satchel started to train me in a slightly different way than the rest of the teammates. He wasn't being easier on me. If anything, he knew exactly how to challenge me to my breaking points in every practice. The way that Satchel trained me differently was by identifying and coaching me toward a higher purpose. He could see that my chubby, soft outside reflected how I felt on the inside. What I wanted was to walk with the same authority and confidence that he had, along with the other influential men in my life. Satchel knew that appealing to the nobler purpose of becoming a stronger and more committed man would be the driving force to help me persevere through practice. From that point on, I would be on that field at 6.30 a.m. six days a week for my freshman, sophomore, and senior year of high school. But how is it that I could endure three years playing a sport that I did not like, did not get paid for, and wasn't good at, but couldn't endure three months in a job that was air-conditioned, paid well, and wasn't nearly as physically taxing? Only when I look back can I say that purpose and calling were a key factor as to why I was able to stay on the team and other kids couldn't. It's also why I couldn't last as a busboy for three months, but could be out in the blazing sun and frigid winters just to get tackled. I believe it is having a purpose, a sense of calling, that allows one to endure. There was a clear vision as to why I was on that football field. It was so I could no longer be a sappy boy and could instead become a strong and unrelenting young man. The mission, the way in which I would reach the vision, was through experiencing two-a-day practices, showing up every day, and leaving any excuse I had off the field which is quite contradictory to the common career advice we hear, do what you're good at or do what you're passionate about. Calling and purpose are not things that require a dramatic epiphany moment. They don't come from living in the woods or going up to an isolated mountaintop. They aren't some singular magical moment where God parts the clouds and clearly writes everything out in the sky. Many believe that pursuing God's calling in our life consists of doing one predestined holy task for the rest of our life. And if we don't find that one thing, then we're missing out. But that belief is not true. God's Spirit is pulling us towards something greater than where we are now. Our call is more than just showing up to church on Sunday, and as followers of Jesus, we should desire to do more with our lives than just survive. 
Like the Israelites in Egypt, we are outgrowing our current situation and need to venture into the desert toward the promised land. Following God's calling in our life is simply the willingness to take one step in the direction where God is pointing and having faith that God will guide you the rest of the way, every step of the way. What to expect on this journey? We mostly spend our lives conjugating three verbs, to want, to have, and to do, forgetting that none of these verbs have any ultimate significance except so far as they are transcended by and included in the fundamental verb, to be. Evelyn Underhill. There is a popular culture that is driven by the idea that we need to have in order to get. We need to have a certain look in order to get the man or woman of our dreams. We need to have the newest phone in order to get the latest features that make life easier. We need to have a lot of money in order to get that sense of contentment and peace in our life. Essentially, we've been led to believe that filling our lives can bring about a fulfilled life. But very rarely are we encouraged and properly guided in simply being. It reminds me of a phrase that goes, we aren't human gettings, we are human beings. Humans are one of the only living creatures on the earth that struggle with knowing what we are designed for. This has led to a lot, if not all, of the chaos in our lives. Adam and Eve struggled with their identity of being made in the image of God. As a result, they forgot who they were and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so they could be like God and gain more wisdom. Ironically, they were already made in God's image and could have had wisdom if they had just continued to trust in God. But they stepped away from who they were made to be. By being the person God made you to be, God will produce in you the things you need in life. Yet being the person God made you to be is much easier said than done. When it comes to discovering why something is made, the best way to find out is by either one, asking the creator why it was made, or two, seeing what the thing produces. There are many resources that try and address one's calling by answering why God made mankind. They seek out answers from life's creator, and it seems very fitting in the Christian community to resort to such a viewpoint. However, this tactic doesn't address the deeper issue of calling. It only focuses on function. For example, if you were to ask the inventor of the hammer, why was the hammer made, they might say to drive down or rip up nails, as well as many other things. But the purpose of that hammer varies from user to user. One person may use the hammer to rip down, while the other may use it to build up. Sure, its function is utilized in both scenarios, but its purpose is not defined simply by its function until we see what someone produces with it. This method of discovering what something is to be by seeing what it produces is best observed when examining plants. A fig tree, despite sharing a variety of the same benefits that other trees offer, such as shade and wood, is known for the type of fruit it produces. The fig tree's unique distinguishing feature is that it produces figs. One could argue that the fig tree's specific calling and purpose is to produce figs. As Christians, you and I may offer a variety of the same benefits that other people on this earth can provide, but our unique calling is to produce something different. Your life, like a garden, holds potential to be used by God. He wants to plant seeds in your heart that will produce a fruitful life. What God produces through you is your purpose and calling. It is who God made you to be. But many of us have struggled to see or maintain the things God has produced in our lives because our gardens are hardened, contaminated, or polluted by the views and values of this world. If we are to understand our calling and prepare our hearts to produce our purpose, we need to go through the same process that we would for preparing land to produce a fruitful garden. By preparing a fertile heart, Jesus' values can take root and produce purpose in our lives. Planting your purpose will take you through that process. The various lessons and information in this book were extracted and assembled in order to provide you with a condensed and coherent framework that will guide you on your journey to discovering God's call. Thousands of pages of literature were read so that you will have the most useful strategies, tools, tips, and insights that you can apply in your life immediately. This guide is an attempt to compile all of the best wisdom found from dozens of the finest pastors, coaches, psychologists, entrepreneurs, and teachers for how to discover your calling. Each day you will read a section of this book or listen to the chapter in the audiobook in sequential order, day one, day two, day three, etc. You are welcome to take notes during each day and write down any thoughts or prayers that come to mind. There are, however, specific parts of the book that will prompt you to write notes. You must take the time to read through and answer the questions in order to get the most out of this book. Passively reading might help to provide you with intellectual knowledge, but change comes from being active in the reading by following the prompts. Therefore, 
follow the prompts, write down answers, take notes, and underline, highlight, or circle in the book when you feel it is necessary. Imperfect notes and imperfect answers are better than no notes or no answers. Each chapter will have a general theme that aids in turning your heart into a fruitful garden. Chapter 1 is all about laying the groundwork, preparing you with the information you need before you can start. It will be full of background information and questions to prepare you for the coming chapters. Think of it as the warm-up where you are making sure you have all the tools you need before you get into the field and start gardening. Chapter 2 will focus on cultivating the heart. Cultivating our heart aids in identifying and removing the surface level desires that don't allow for true fruitfulness and fulfillment. Proper cultivation is the first step to allowing God to produce in us a fruitful life that is well defined by vision, mission, and purpose. If God's word can't take root in our lives, then we will miss out on experiencing the abundance that can come from planting what few things God has given us. Chapter 3 takes things deeper as we work on digging out false beliefs and values. Below the surface, there are often deeply buried barriers that are obstructing our development. These deeply buried barriers are often false values or beliefs that, if not addressed, will hinder the depth that God is able to grow us. Chapter 4 is all about stepping back and envisioning the big picture. What's the end game? By visualizing the end game and reflecting on what drives us, we start to imagine what a fruitful life could consist of. If we know what our garden will look like, we can better discern if where we're going is in the right direction. Chapter 5 is where we'll finally start planting. We'll discover which of Jesus' values deeply penetrate our hearts the most, then use those values and everything we've learned prior to craft an empowering and impactful vision and mission that can develop and guide you in being the person God is calling you to be. Chapter 6 is about watering, grooming, and weeding your garden, which are proactive actions. Just like any garden, you don't just plant and leave. You need to manage the ground and care for the plants that you intend to grow. This chapter will help to ensure that you are able to follow through with maintaining your garden and produce the most fruit from it. Chapter 7 is where we wrap up by comparing baseline measurements that were gathered from Chapter 1. You'll be able to look back at where you were when you started and gain confidence from seeing all the progress that has been made. This book will show you how to discover who God is leading you to be, the vision, and will point you toward the path that will bring you there, the mission. Joseph, Moses, and Jesus are fantastic biblical examples of what it looks like to have clarity of vision and mission. They knew their calling and moved with purpose. They were formed by God to fulfill the responsibilities given to them. We see from Joseph's journey in Genesis how God gave Joseph a vision and then allowed him to go through struggles that not only put his values, integrity, and faith to the test, but also put him in the right circumstances that led to him becoming the second most influential and powerful person in Egypt. Moses was insecure about speaking to Pharaoh, but through trusting in God and stepping out in faith despite his fears, Moses eventually gained the confidence to face Pharaoh. Moses was able to clearly communicate the vision and mission God placed on his heart, thus leading the Israelites being set free from Egypt's rule. But when it comes to having the most successful ministry and widely adopted vision in the Bible, Jesus of Nazareth takes the cake. He had a vision for the renewal of all the world and was on a mission to accomplish that. Billions of people have bought into it and continue to do so today. Jesus' ministry, although multifaceted, had a clear goal with a simple vision and mission. Jesus' calling was to serve, seek, and save. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, verse 45 and Matthew 20, verse 28. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Mark 2, verse 17. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Luke 19, verse 10. Jesus' entire ministry, his calling, the vision, and mission are easily embodied in those single sentences. During the times when things got complicated or things got difficult, or when the people he was trying to serve and save were actively persecuting him, Jesus was capable of viewing it all in the greater perspective of his purpose. When he was up on the cross praying to God, Jesus did not condemn. Rather, he asked for forgiveness on behalf of the sinner. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke 23, verse 34. Your calling will be the specifics of the vision and mission that you'll discover in this guide, and your purpose will be the things that are produced from living it out. The goal isn't to simply talk about the topic of vision and mission in the traditional business sense, the way we are defining vision in this book is to have clearly defined the roles in one's life. 
And the way we are defining mission in this book is the process God will use to shape you into successfully fulfilling that role. Don't expect this book or your vision and mission to provide you all the right answers in every season of life. What you should expect is to have a firmer understanding of the unique combination of biblical values you identify with and the calling God has for you. This journey will bring you closer to God and feel his love in new ways. If you want to get the most out of this book and experience true transformation, then you need to be close to God throughout the whole process. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. At this point, I'm sure some questions have been answered, while new ones have begun to sprout up. Don't worry. As you get further on this journey, those questions will soon be answered as your calling becomes clearer. Are you a Christian leader looking to develop the skills needed to maximize the fruitfulness in your daily walk with Christ? Do you want to overcome the burden of not living life to the fullest and fully step into your God-given calling? If you do, then you should get a copy of my book, Planting Your Purpose, a 20-day guide to discover God's calling. It's not just another devotional book. Planting Your Purpose is your 20-day guide that will provide you with the strategies, tools, and insights to turn things around immediately. You will learn how to avoid the top five mistakes Christians make when pursuing their calling in life. You'll develop more joy in your walk with Jesus and unlock the secrets to mastering integrity. And by the end of 20 days, not only will you know your calling, but you'll have an even greater sense of fulfillment and confidence in your life. Everywhere, Christians are raving about this amazing new guide to discover their God-given calling. Get your copy by clicking the link in the show notes or by going to plantingyourpurpose.com. That's plantingyourpurpose.com.